And, and out of respect to the reading of God's Word, if your health allows you, would you please stand with us today as we read Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 through 12. <clears throat> what I do? Hammer! Did you make me do that? <laughs> we'll start at Genesis and read all the way to Exodus. How's that? He's in the right place whether I am or not. All right, I'm going to try to read Exodus chapter 3 or wherever I may be at, okay? <clears throat> now, Moses kept the flock. Is that the same word y'all got there? Amen. Okay. <laughs> Bless us, Lord Jesus. Now, Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses says, I will now go, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he says, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place wherein thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he says, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hevites and the Jebusites and the Clevelandites and the Kulamites and a <laughs> few termites too. And verse 9 says, Now therefore, I may have added one or two. That wasn't even an IV right there. <laughs> Verse 10 says, Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth thy people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he says, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee, that I have sent thee, when thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Wow. Lord, if I put myself in Moses' position, what a heavy time that must have been to hear your voice speak out of that burning bush, to know that God speaks to us individually. It's kind of overwhelming. Lord, there's some brothers and sisters here today that desperately need to hear you speak. I don't know what they're going through, but I can just feel in the air that there's tension, there's conflict, there's people with chaos in their hearts right now, not fighting amongst people in the church, Lord, but personal problems that they deal with on their own life, and today they've come with heavy, heavy hearts. And it may just be that, Lord, in the midst of our chaos, you ask us to do even more, something like you did Moses here. But I got to say, Lord, your will be done, not mine, because uh, you know what we can handle, and you know what we're capable of. And I'm so thankful that when you take us beyond our limits, that you're willing to take up the rest. So, Father, with that in mind, would you take this message, and God, I'm just going to kind of back up and let you come and speak to the hearts that you need to. And may you call to people out of the burning word this morning. And we listen to what God has to say. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. amen. Y'all can be seated. Poor old Moses. You gotta remember Moses now, he was raised up in Pharaoh's house. If you know the history because of the fact that Pharaoh was gonna kill all the Israelite children, the male children, Long story short, Moses winds up being raised up in Pharaoh's own palace, God's hand at work. Then one day, Moses goes out and he sees one of his Jewish brethren being mistreated, beaten, 
having to suffer. Moses got a little angry and he struck the Egyptian down. He killed the man and he buried him in the sand. Sounds like a good idea. They got a lot of sand over there. Surely you get away with that. But the next day, somebody already knew about it. People were talking. And you know, whenever you've buried a body and people get to talking, you ain't got but one option. Either go to prison or get out of town. And Moses ran for his life. Now, at age 40, he leaves and he flees and he goes out into the desert. For the next 40 years in his life, he's almost 80 at this point right here, and we come to the time he's been keeping the flocks of his father-in-law Jethro. Jethro was a priest of Midian, which tells me that God was already at work, and you know something, we sometimes seem to think that the Israelites is the only way that God reveals himself to us through the Jews, but I got news for you, God's been saving Gentiles way back since even before the Jews were a nation. And here we find Moses now for the next 40 years of his life out in the desert. He's nearly 80 years old. He's almost as old as Hammer at this point, bless his heart. (laughs) Get away from him over here. Minding his own business. Taking his sheep out. Enjoying the beauty of the mountains. And he sees this thing, a bush. And he doesn't really pay a whole lot of attention, but he notices it doesn't burn up. After some time, it's still burning, and it's still full. The leaves are probably still on it. And Moses says, let me turn and go see this thing, what it is. And I want you to notice right now that God had not spoken to Moses as far as we know, in all these years, he had walked out in these woods. All these years, he may have walked past this exact same place. He might have been by that same bush before countless times. But now, all of a sudden, it's different. You may have drove by this church a hundred times. You may have sat in here a handful of times. But you know, something could be different today. And I want you to notice that God never spoke to Moses until he turned to go see the bush. And as soon as Moses turned to go towards God, God spoke to him. And let me tell you something, gentlemen, today, some of us in here, you've got decisions to make. Let's be honest, for the majority of our life, we've tried to handle our problems in our own way. We're big, bad boys. We can take care of ourselves until we find out that don't really work. That'll work good for a little while, but it's temporary, I promise you. And then when the time comes and you can't handle things, who are you going to call? Who are you going to fall down and cry out to? I want to tell you, when Moses turned to God, God turned to Moses. Today there's some men and women in here that have passed by the house of God many times. You've been in, mer- in services where God spoke many times. And maybe today God's saying, you've got to make a decision of which direction you're going to go in the rest of your life. Moses would say, I'm nearly 80 years old. My life's almost over. I got news. You got another 40 years coming, Moses. He lived to his 120 years old. His strength was not weakened and his eyesight was not dimmed. I can't even say that in 50. You kidding me? Good gracious and lie. He was a blessed fella. But God had his hand on him. And I want to share with you a couple of things about when God asks you to do overwhelming things. When God puts more on you than you can handle, the good news is God's promised to be right there with you because if you can't handle that weight, he's going to have to be the one to hold it up. And I expect there's some folk in here this morning that's probably under some heavy weight. You've got a lot of stress. You've got a lot of things weighing down on your shoulders. And the good news is today, if it's overbearing to you, God's got it under control today. But you notice when Moses was desperate, when Moses was out in the desert and he had nowhere to turn and he thought his life was over, he thought he was just going to be an old shepherd boy. All that training I had back in Egypt, I ain't going to use none of that stuff. Y'all remember when y'all was in school and you go through uh, algebra and we said, I ain't never going to use none of that stuff. Never use algebra. You thought that before? Hey Amen. Until I took up billiards. And I found out it's all about angles and playing pool is about algebra. Now you'll go and pay attention next week in class, won't you? Because you can learn something. But for years, most of the stuff we never used. But then God had a purpose for it. 
I want to tell you, God has put you and me through some tough times in life, and we didn't understand them, and we didn't know why, and we didn't realize that God was going to use it later, but now God's got a purpose for Moses and all he's been through, and I promise you, my friend, God has a purpose for you today and everything you've been through. Notice verse 2 in this chapter. It says this, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame out of fire, a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. The Lord, now when it says in verse 2, the angel of the Lord, every time in the Old Testament when you see the angel of the Lord and the word Lord is capitalized with all four letters, what that is, is telling us, that is a pre-incarnate visitation of Jesus Christ. Jesus came on earth because Jesus was the way that God revealed himself to mankind. If God showed himself, Moses would have died. It would have killed him. God sent Jesus as the angel of the Lord down in verse 2. And the cool thing about it is whenever you get overwhelmed, whenever you got to understand this man's lived with a murder warrant for 40 years. He ain't forgot that. God's fixed to tell him to go right back down yonder where they're looking for you. 40 years. People forget a lot, but somebody, somebody's liable to remember. Lord, you want me to go there of all places? Let me tell you something. When God called me to preach, first of all, I thought God was tripping. Uh, you know, a lot of people say when God called them to preach that they ran from his call and they ran from his call. And, and I want to tell you something. When God called me to preach, I couldn't believe he was getting that desperate. I, I said, Lord, have mercy. Uh, but I answered the call and then, and then, Blowed my mind, where's he put me? Right here in my hometown. It wasn't funny. <laughs> now, I've had to deal with a lot of old ghosts and a lot of old problems and a lot of old beliefs and things like that, but thank God. I'm, I'm gonna tell you something. The Lord Jesus himself said that no prophet is without honor except in his hometown. In other words, it's gonna be tough to try to minister in your hometown. Absolutely, thank God it has been tough. But let me tell you something, there's been families here that have had deaths that I don't know anybody else could have stood over that body. There's been boys I've run with and, and ladies that I was friends with back in the day that have died and I've had opportunity to lead their family to Jesus over their casket. And if I'd gone somewhere else, I wouldn't be here for that. So let me tell you something, I'm glad God put me where I am. You can talk about me all you want to. I'm about half used to it, amen. People talk Talk about me so much my hair fell out, bless the Lord. But it's okay because if that's all you got to talk about, help yourself. I'm going to talk about Jesus, okay? Because I'm going to tell you right now, if you look at me, I'm a mess. I've got all kinds of problems and I'm not the fellow you're supposed to pattern your life after. Jesus Christ is the one we're supposed to follow his example today. Not the preacher, not the teacher, not the deacon, not the elder, but Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And his presence is what made everything okay. Moses out in the desert. There could have been bears. There could have been lions. There could have been all kinds of things. Could have been a skunk. If you ain't scared of a skunk, you ain't ever had a tangle with one. I'm going to tell you right now. But he doesn't worry about any of the dangers when he focuses on God, does he? You don't see him worrying about his sheep scattering. You don't see him worrying about what's happening to his sheep because all of a sudden when we focus on God, our job don't matter as much. See, some of us in here, I bet you there's somebody here today that one of the biggest stresses in your life is your job. And it ought not be that way. Some of us, our biggest stress could be anything. Whatever it is, if we bring it before God, I'll tell you right now, whether it's our job or our marriage or our relationships or our bills or finances or whatever it might be, if we get a glimpse of God, all that stuff kind of fades off in a distance. But let me tell you something. When we see God, nothing else is really important. The presence of God is what made it all right here. Notice how he responded unto God in verse 3. And Moses says, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. I got to go check this out. I got to go look and see what happens. But in verse 4, as soon as he went toward that bush, the Lord saw that he turned aside to see. God called unto him. You see what the, the order that happened? Moses looked to see what was going on. I've had people tell me, preacher, I'll come by that church every Sunday and I've got all kinds of cars out in that parking lot. What are y'all doing? I said, we fight. <laughs> really? 
Come and see. <laughs> you don't ever know. Hey, I've had people come. Everybody will come see a fight. You know what I mean? We have a spiritual warfare every time we meet in the house of God. I didn't mean y'all was fighting. I meant there's a battle going on in the airways of this church right now. There are angels in here battling over what you hear and what you see. And I'm telling you right now, God has sent his angels to battle amongst us. And if we could open our eyes, our blinded eyes, and spiritually see for one moment, it would probably overwhelm us to a point of fear we couldn't handle it. But there is a spiritual warfare going on right now. But when Moses looked toward God, things changed. Because when he looked, God sounded off. And then he listened. Let me tell you something, folks. You have came by and looked this morning to see what God has to say. Hopefully that the preacher will get out the way and God will come and speak to your heart. And if the Lord speaks to you today, when you listen to him, what's going to be your response? We can come by and we can look and we can come by and we can listen. But if there's no change in our lives, then I'm afraid we've wasted our time. Verse number five says this, and, and he said, draw not nigh hither, but put off thy shoes from off thy feet for the place wherein thou standest is holy ground. We need to have respect for God's presence. We need to have respect for God's presence. When I'm in here, a lot of times at night or during the daytime, even during the week, I, I refuse to bring a, a drink into the sanctuary. Just, just you say, well, yes, that's rules. That's, that's just I, I believe in respecting for the Lord. I got, I got a little thing of water back here. I only use it if I get to choke it. <coughs> but you don't see me suck on it much unless I'm coughing. That's just for emergency right there. In case somebody runs at me, I can squirt them. You know, you never can tell. But you know what? I, I just have a respect for the house of God. You say, well, I don't, I, you, you believe whatever God convicts you of, all right? But I'm going to tell you, we need to have respect for the things of the Lord. It was a time when people preaching the gospel got respect. Now they get ridiculed. If you're not careful, they'll get sued. Now we're looked at as mentally ill. Now we're looked at as the strange folks. Glory to God, didn't God say over in 1 Peter that we're supposed to be a peculiar people? I think he was talking about our church when he said that, amen. We are a peculiar people, and I kind of like that today. But the presence of God made a difference. Notice not only the presence of God, but the passion of God. In verse 7 it says here, the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. Look at this. For I know their sorrows. I'm so glad God is watching. I, I want to think about this. For over 400 years, they served as slaves down in Egypt. For over 400 years, as far as we know, not a single prophet rose up. As far as we know, not one single preacher stood up and proclaimed the gospel of the Lord. We don't know what happened down there, but apparently it was a deep, dark time. Have you ever dealt with depression that lasted 400 years? That's generation after generation after generation being born into slavery to work themselves to death with no hope of freedom, no hope of nothing, but God had passion on them. Some of us, sometimes we think that we work and we work and we work and we accomplish nothing. What is my purpose here? I want to tell you, sometimes we suffer. Some of you are in very difficult relationships and you go through hardships and suffering. I want you to know God is watching you today and he is listening. He said, I heard my people's sorrows. I have saw what their afflictions are and I've got a passionate heart for my people. God, he stood up there for 400 years and them Egypt has probably said, your God ain't no God. Your God, he don't exist. He will and let you go for this but I'm going to tell you my God's just getting madder and madder and madder and when he said I've had enough he let the bush catch on fire caught Moses' attention and said hey old man I want you to go down and get my people and Moses said huh? But, 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 huh? I can't, I can't who am I? <laughs> By the way let me tell you something else here if God calls you to do something I really believe in my heart one of the requirements for God to call somebody is for you to feel inadequate to do it. If you ever think, well, God called me to teach a Sunday school class, and I'll probably do a pretty good job at that. Don't you teach that class. You will mess it up so bad. But if you say, well, I, you know, I, that class needs a teacher, and God, I, I can't teach, but Lord, I'll try. And, and I'm just, Lord, I'm just going to put my, hand, my faith in you. And, and boy, you're going to wind up having one of the best messages you ever heard in your life. Amen. Because we've got to lean on God. 
Moses had to lean on God. Why? Because God had passion for his people. And you know, I want to remind you today that even though it may have been years, it may have been a long time since you felt a touch from God, he's still watching his people today. He still sees our sorrows and he hears our affliction. And thank God when we crawl out to him and cry, he says, I hear the, pri- the cries of my people today. Amen. Are you calling out to God? I want to notice one last thing here. When God is waiting in verse number eight, he says, and I come down to, to deliver them. I'm fixing to do something big. The last thing I want you to notice is the promise of God. When God puts too much on you, his presence, his passion, and th- thirdly and finally, his promise is what gets us through. Verse 10 says he's got a promise of deliverance. Verse 10 says, come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. I'm going to promise to deliver them. That's cool. Moses, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh, and he's going to deliver all my people. That, that'd be kind of like me saying, Eric, I'm going to send you to Washington, and I'm going to get the president to just let all the military go free. Just, just let them all go back home. And, be. and it happens. I mean, one man going to the most powerful man in the world, Pharaoh, at that time. He was ruler of the world's greatest army and empire, the Egyptian empire. One old redneck sheep farmer out in the desert, God says, I want you to go down and show that Pharaoh up. Well, that ain't asking much now, is it? Boy, I want to tell you something. When God puts a call on you, it'll scare you to death. It'll seem impossible. But I'm going to tell you something. God keeps his word, does he not? God called him to deliver me. And guess what? We done read the rest of the book. We know they get delivered only by the miraculous power of God. But not only did he give a promise of deliverance, but he also gave a promise of direction. Verse 11 says, And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go into Pharaoh? Verse 12, And he says, Certainly I will be with thee. And this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou brought Forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this man. This is what God tells you. He says, I'm going to give you some direction, son. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to Egypt, get the people, and bring them back here. Now, I'm going to give you a promise. you got to love this promise. I'm going to give you a promise that I'm going to do what I say. As soon as you get back here, you'll know what happened. What kind of promise is that? I mean, can't I get halfway there and see another burning bush and I know I'm on the right track? I mean, I need a little encouragement. And when I get back, how about when I'm down there standing in front of Pharaoh, a little pat on the back would be kind of nice. When I get back, Lord, I hate to tell you, but by the time we get back, we're going to kind of figure you've already delivered us. Amen? What God is saying is, I'm stating the obvious. When I say you're coming back, you're going to be back. Don't doubt what I say. Just get up and get to moving. And if anything else, I bet God was probably wanting to say, excuse me, Moses, why are you arguing instead of walking? You got kinfolk down there suffering. You got kinfolk down there dying, and you want to stand here and argue. And say, I, I can't talk too good. And I, I can't, who am I? I, 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 I yeah, yeah. Let me tell you something, church. There's people here this morning need to get right with God. You've got kin folks dying, going to hell. We've got kin folks suffering under the hand of, of affliction of the enemy right now. And we're sitting here making excuses instead of getting up and getting to this altar today. We've got a problem with that. God says, I've got a job for you to do. It may seem overwhelming, but first and foremost, you've got to make sure your heart's right with God by asking Jesus, into your life and saving you and then he do, when he does that then say Lord I'm available to go wherever you want me to go Amen. and he promised to always get us there I'm going to ask Sister Elaine to come prepare him of invitation and as she does I just want to say this God has a special purpose for every person here what is your calling and how are you responding what is God's calling and how are you responding stand with me if you